No, that's crazy. Yeah, we. I mean, I have a little bit of experience with our company. I don't deal with the actual reading of it, but things I've learned and seen, and the idea of taking that integrative approach. So, hey, let's actually look at your stomach. Yes, you have to collect your poop three times a day, and I'm sorry if you're going to do that. Um, but you can start to look at what you're producing and what you're excreting and whether or not you're absorbing what you need to absorb. And we start looking at injuries and, you know, tendon health and muscle tissue and everything as a holistic approach. Well, we got to look at the internal environment, right? If our environment's messed up inside and we're trying to impose a stressor on the body, but we have no idea what the internal system's like. And you have um, certain deficiencies or certain aspects that you're lacking. <laughs> And these are certain areas where it, again, people go, oh, that's not scientific. There's no study. Well, unfortunately, if you understand complex systems and their dynamic interactions and not to get too detailed, I'll, I'll explain it as simple as I can. But what happens is we have an outcome, like a sprained ankle. And we say, oh, ankle weak, ankle get hurt. Right. Well, kind of, right? right? Well, maybe it's ankle weak. That's a, a risk factor athlete didn't sleep enough for the past three nights risk factor athlete um had some sort of physical contact during the game that perturbed their system risk mm -hmm. factor athlete nutritionally wasn't recovering from previous workouts and games risk factors so what happens you have all these risk factors and that's just a very um those are not all the risk factors there's a lot involved but these risk factors come about and then we have the probabilistic nature of something to happen so oh, how likely is it that something bad will go wrong? And we see the last straw on the camel's back, sprained ankle, and we go, oh, ankle weak. But maybe it's didn't sleep enough, ankle weak, all this other stuff. And that ankle sprain for people interested in complex systems, it's called an emergent pattern. So there's a common pattern that occurs when you have things go wrong. So if you think about an ACL, it's like, oh, glute medius is weak, uh, knee valgus. Um, right neuromuscular control, all these things that go into it and nothing can pinpoint it. So if we are including these bio, you know, biomechanical factors of knee valgus, why aren't we including some internal factors like gut health or um, you know, the blood work or the micronutrient deficiencies? And yes, I know I'm not versed enough to speak on micronutrient deficiencies and interactions of uh, you know, health and whatnot, but something as simple as collagen and vitamins, having ad adequate vitamin C for, you know, uh, tendon healing instead of, you know, repair is obviously a factor. And so when we start looking at the body, we got to look at it as a big picture. And it's not just how your knee bends. It's not how you shoot a jump shot. And it's not how you land every time. Or our body. Things, so, yeah, it's our body. Our body is so much more resilient and durable than we give it credit for. I mean, We've survived as a species for a very long time through very harsh conditions. And you're going to tell me it's that one jump that got you? Like, <laughs> one jump got you. One jump is the one that, oh, that knee's a little valgus. That's the one that got you. I mean, if you super slow-mo a lot of these great uh, expressions of physical capacity in sport, it would, you would you'd be like, oh, my God, their knee, they're this, they're that. But in reality – like that's not even close to the, the, the reason why they like break or don't break. And Jordan Shallow, brilliant dude. He, he gave me this um, metaphor. He was saying to fill up a pond, uh, it's like this fungus that will fill up a pond and it doubles its size every day. So if it starts off at like, you know, 0.2, then the next day it'd be 0.4. And he asked me, he's like, okay, if it's going to fill up in 30 days, to fill up the whole pond, What's the day it's half full? And then I thought for a second, and it took me a lot longer than I should have thought about it. But he's like, but he interjects and he goes, day 29. I, was, I didn't want an answer, by the way. Yeah, I was like, day 29. I was like, <laughs> that's how I look at the human body. Like, yes. yeah, it's literally the last thing. And then boom. And so it's all these, we could have had all these interventions from day two to day 28 or day 29 even. But no, it's that one just last um, uh, straw on the camel's back to just, there it goes, you know. And that's what's great about being in a collegiate setting and being at Stanford is we have a lot of safety nets for our safety nets, if you will. So we try to have as many, quote unquote, KPIs and objective measurements to give us an idea of what could possibly happen. 
But in reality, it's still a dynamic environment. So I don't understand, like, I can't account for school. I can't account for their sleep. I mean, we could through like Whoop or Aura or whatever, but it's not realistic in a team, in, a, in, in our setting. And, uh, and their gut health, like we ain't picking up poop three times a day, right? We're not drawing blood once a week. We're not doing these things. So unless we're doing that, then you're just trying to create the most resilient, durable human being so they can withstand the stressors some more than others uh, for, to hopefully have a successful season. No, that's like, I hate to break it to people. We don't know what we're doing. <laughs> we're doing our best. And I think Chase, when I was with him uh, at Stanford, he had a great line. He said, we can't guarantee success, but we can almost guarantee you're not guaranteed to fail. And what I mean by that is that you can have all these KPIs and really we're looking at you know, if you jump nine inches, you're probably not going to be, you know, very good at basketball unless you're seven, two, right. right? And so we're looking at the human system as a means of understanding, you know, what is going to really lag behind in regards to your performance assessment and what might be hindering you. In regards to longitudinal tracking, can I get a little bit of data a lot? The way I explain it, it's kind of like, I don't ask my girlfriend, Kelsey, how she's doing once a week. You know, I ask her every day and why I ask that every day is to realize, you know, oh, are my clothes that are left out pissing her off or, <laughs> right. you, know, you know, did I not, did I forget that we we're supposed to go on a date last night? You know, I might or not have forgot a wallet last night when we went to dinner. Right. Um, totally on an accident I was supposed to buy, but that's a true story. I mean, that's the most important thing is you got to have feedback daily, right? And mm -hmm. the way we do it here, it's really simple. We take a controlled environment, do some things in it before they go into a dynamic environment, which is basketball games or basketball practice. So what we do is we call that microdosing. We, it's our way of training every day in some form or fashion. These individuals come in, do their work, their human capacity, A series, if you will. Then after that, they go into their B series, which is complex. This is really what I know what's going on. Now, don't get me wrong. When they walk in, they get their weights. Are we joking? Are we making eye contact? Do we get that handshake? How firm is that handshake? These are all the uh, qu uh, quantitative things that I'm trying to pick up as they're coming through the door. And then you watch them say we're hitting a clean complex and they're going through their motions and they're constantly changing their grip or the pool isn't looking too good. Like It's like, man, it ain't that sharp today. Well, boom, that's my control. Now, it's not the most objective feedback, but at least it's a constant. And so that's my way of having, once again, safety nets for my safety nets. And then weekly, or depending on how many games we have that week, we do our force plate jumps. So once again, another safety net. And then we have our connects on data, so our GPS data that they do on the practice gym. Once again, any one of those in, in isolation doesn't tell me much. But if I have a bunch of them, then I can at least paint a better picture from quantitative to qualitative. And then I can go and nitpick what I think their intervention may need to be. And so it's not going to be perfect, not even close, but as long as you have a constant and yours is beautiful, like you said, just something simple that you get daily. Hey, how are you doing? And you know how they express that. I'm doing good. I'm doing good. I'm cool. I'm great. Like, you know what those influxes are. Like, you know what they're, how they're truly feeling just based off that one question alone. But once again, if you can set up your system or your program or whatever to have safety nets for your safety nets, then I think you can you can catch a lot of those along the way. Yeah, no, that makes sense. It's how do we provide context to a situation, right? And the more information that we can apply that we deem classifiable to a system, like jumping is, you know, your lower body strength and your right. verbal expressions, your most emotional state, um, and maybe even sleep or other things that go into that, the more we can understand what's actually happening to the person. So I want to kind of reel you back for a second. You said something about microdosing. And yeah. in terms of microdosing, you're referring to training a little bit often. Yep. Right? Training That's a little bit all the time. It. And Corey's well known for this. And for those at home listening, I'm going to do my best to explain it shortly because I got a question off of it. Yeah. So I, if he explains it, we'll sit here for an hour and a half because it's great to listen to. But I want to give him uh, a little bit of a different direction off of athletics about it. But firstly, Microdosing is the idea that we're applying a moderate level to low level stressor consistently 
And that adaptation occurs from the aggregation of those stresses over a period of time. So we're never going too high. We're never going too low. And the idea is that training in the weight room is only one small piece of your life. So if you have a programmed high day and you don't sleep that night or you have um, emotional stress or for your case, you have practice, then all of a sudden that high day gets magnified and starts spilling over the bucket and becomes too much. So the idea of micro dosing, especially in a non-controlled external environment where it's called life, right? We're trying to apply enough that you can handle. And if someone's feeling good, then they can push it a little bit that day themselves. Now, my question for you, Corey, is I love it in an athletic sense, but I also see it being very applicable to anyone out there, general population, Absolutely. Um, especially in terms of, and I got two things on this, in terms of one, someone learning a movement, you get a chance to do it often and daily. And someone who wants to learn how to be in the weight room. And secondly, because there are, let's say we do it um, eight out of 10 days, right? If you only miss one day, you're only missing 10% of your entire workout, right? So instead of doing, looking at this whole all one workout one day, you look at like a 10 day period. If you've got eight days to pick from and you just can't do one, you only miss 10% versus if you only had five days to pick one, and you miss one, you miss 20%, right? And so now we have the ability to uh, be more flexible in our environment. So how does that fit in for like a general population? If it was my dad or my girlfriend trying to learn how to use some of this micro dosing in the weight room concept, how do you mm -hmm. apply that? So 100% with, with micro dosing, the reason why it came about was it was a solution to a problem, right? My problem is, I don't have enough exposure to my guys. So how do I create more training frequency? And now we got rid of warmups, something that was just kind of getting them ready for practice. They kind of don't care about it. The coach hated seeing me do it. I personally hated doing it. So now it was a solution. What it turned into was motor learning. Now you want to learn how to train? Well, do it all the time. So that's where complex comes in. It's the volume of work, right? So basically you take a barbell and you do every movement that you would do in a weight room in some sense in one set. So you hinge, you do a hip flexion, you do a press, you do a pull. If I break down each one of those into isolation, it would look like RDLs, squat, push, military press, or row. Those are all movements that you would do. And if you separated each exercise in an isolation, you would go more resistance on just like you would see in general fitness, right? Like we're going to do three sets of 10 on bench press or three sets of 10 on back squat. Well, that's great. How about we just put it all in one and now we have more exposure. So now I'm learning how to do the movements. And then you can't tell me that doing one thing once a week is actually going to make you learn the movement. So now you learn those little small idiosyncrasies that you see with 30 year experienced power lifters who truly understand like, Ooh, from my body, this foot stance, or this is how I, I start to hinge here within my squat at X degree. And that's how they perfect it is because they have so much exposure to it. So we're doing the same thing. We're just trying to create exposure at lower thresholds and, and then doing it often. Now, as far as general population, what's the number one concern? Uh, I don't have enough time. Oh, oh, really? You don't have 30 minutes a day. 20 to 30 minutes a day to knock out a workout every day, I call BS. I say, you just don't want to train. So that's where microdosing to me is beautiful in the general population is because it's literally the way you start your day, it's lunch, or it's when you get off work. Perfect. You can pick any of those three slots, 20 to 30 minutes, you can eat and shower and get back to work or before work. So you can't tell me that everybody doesn't have that situation. So now you're creating training frequency. You're getting enough volume throughout the week. Now we have, um, uh, and then most importantly, like you brought up, if I just had to miss that one day, it's 10% of my training. Like it's not, well, I only train twice a week. So 50% of my training is gone. So that's where I think it's beautiful. And that's where it could work from general population to the most elite athletes in the world. And the reason why I say the most elite athletes in the world is because I just so happen to train two of them. So I do it with, with all of these populations.